Good morning. Welcome to the System Engineering Forum virtual series. I'm Al Hoheb. I'll be kicking off the series this morning and I'll have a couple of opening remarks. So with me are the four authors of the Model Portfolio Management Guide. I'll introduce them shortly. And I'd also like to thank our CorpCom team for setting this up. We're slated for an hour. We should have plenty of time for questions along the way. So next slide, please. The System Engineering Forum is a set of virtual events. It's hosted by the Aerospace Corporation's Chief Engineer's Office, and the focus is on applying model-based system engineering across the space enterprise, contributing to mission success, while fulfilling the digital engineering and digital acquisition vision. The virtual events this year springboard off of four very successful face-to-face -face events in the last couple of years, and it's offered to our broad aerospace community. So we welcome all of you to view and to make use of the materials we provide you today. The materials are cleared for public release. They are in our archive section of the System Engineering Forum site. We are also going to post a video in the Aerospace YouTube channel. Next slide, please. We have several events coming up. Today we have the Model Portfolio Management Guide Talk. Then we have a talk on in-depth, which is talking about digital engineering ecosystems and a model that organizations can take advantage of in order to design their ecosystems. In July, we're talking about design for principles, which is taking a look at the system engineering process, flipping it and thinking about the principles rather than requirements or capabilities. So that should be a very interesting um, a talk on how we could rearrange this system engineering process. And then in September, we're gonna tackle mission-based mission assurance and flight worthiness, mission assurance for space systems and flight worthiness for flight systems. How do you use models uh, in order to do mission assurance and flight worthiness tasks uh, to take advantage of modeling and the economies of scale? In FY22, we're starting to design the, the slate of programs. So later this year, fiscal year, we'll be publishing those different events going forward. Next slide, please. We are recording this event, so your mics have been muted, and please keep your video cameras off to conserve bandwidth. You're all familiar with Zoom, I'm sure, at this point, but if you, if you have any problems, if you look in the chat box, there are several URLs which will direct you to how to either ask questions or how to get help in using the Zoom application itself. Next slide, please. All right, with that, let me introduce the presenters today. Um, as I mentioned, we have the four authors of the document. Um, I'm Al Hoheb, I'm the digital engineering lead for this. I'm the creator and project lead for the guide. And with me is uh, Misak Zedelin, Jordan Howie, and Alex Chang. Give you a little bit of my background. I've got 30 years of satellite systems and acquisition experience. Let me turn now to Misak. Misak specializes in software and systems engineering. He has over 15 years of experience in software and hardware design, development, and testing. He's led, develop, led the development of software and hardware for satellites, military, and commercial aircraft, as well as implantable biomedical devices. Turning now to Jordan Howie, Jordan is a member of our technical staff in Agile Systems Engineering. His current focus is on data centricity and transitioning of processes from document-based to model-based in efforts to assist customers in achieving digital engineering. Jordan is currently finishing up his master's degree in systems engineering. And our, our fourth person, Alex Chang, he's also my system engineering forum co-chair. Alex, thank you so much for helping me organize the whole series. He's graciously uh, accepted the job today of monitoring chat and helping us field your questions to the different presenter team. Alex is specializing in digital and model-based engineering techniques as it applies to system architectures. His current research is on application of digital and model-based practices to various processes and workflows to help and assist in acquisitions and R&D efforts. Okay, so that provides the overall introduction and now let's get into the content. As I mentioned, this material is cleared for public release as is the guide. So we're very proud to provide this model portfolio management guide to the community. 
and we're excited about its use. It's already in use and I'll explain that a little bit more. So let's move to the next slide. These are the different topics we're gonna to hit today. And let me just interject that we've got plenty of time to field questions. So if you have questions, please type them in chat. Alex will then um, monitor that and help us field those questions. And then of course, we've got four different authors to help address your questions. I'll provide the uh, introductory material and then I'll turn it over to Mitzag. So let me go to the next slide, the need. So let me talk about the anecdotal need. If I was going to ask each member online today, what does model management and what does model portfolio mean to you? I would probably get a different answer from every individual. And in fact, that's what it, what's happened. Uh, when I've worked on different acquisitions, both on the RFP side or the source selection side, and the government has put the words, uh, the contractor shall conduct model management activities, the, the variance in response has been so huge that it's very hard to make sense of it. And that's not the problem, really. The problem is, is that if there is a large variance, then uh, there's probably something being missed in the approach of managing a portfolio of models. So as, as uh, that anecdotal evidence was collected over the last couple of years, um, it was confirmed by different assessments. So I'm the author of the Encozy model-based capabilities matrix in applying that capabilities assessment to a variety of programs and organizations, model management always scored very low, meaning that generally there wasn't someone assigned to model management. There was no spec or standard or guide that organizations, even internal policy that was available to help the model management approach. Um, that it was usually done ad hoc within an organization. It was certainly wasn't done in a consistent fashion across organizations. And that inhibited a lot of um, model management integration and reuse activities. So that was then confirmed by the System Engineering Research Center, the CERC System Engineering Survey, which again noted that model management as self-reported by organizations was extremely immature and unknown. That was the spark to pull the team together to create the model portfolio management guide. And that's what we've done. So in order to quickly help our different aerospace customers at aerospace, we put together the model portfolio management guide technical operating report, as you can see, to, uh, should be 2020 01577. It's been cleared for public release and it's in, available to you in the downloads page. So with that, we had a, uh, the idea that it would be really nice to make this available to the larger non-DOD, non-IC, non-government organizations. So we wrote it in the style guide of NCOSI documents, International Council of System Engineering. So NCOSI and AIAA both use the same style guide for publications. So we adhered to both style guides in order to publish this. And then the, the, app, the technical operating report uh, was used for um, acquisitions right out the bat. So the minute we had it approved for public release, it was used on a couple of acquisitions as a reference documents. Um, and that's been very useful going forward. So organizations have a common understanding of, of both what the request is for model portfolio management and the response. So we continue through uh, in COSI, uh, MISAC, Alex and Jordan are taking the leads on public pushing the uh, in COSI um, teams to take a look at the guide and potentially update it as an Encozy guide, which will make it much more wide, widely held and um, known to the community. So let's move to the next slide. So one of the questions that we get asked is, where does this guide fit into overall digital engineering strategy and implementation? So here's a, a model relevant document tree. Uh, I apologize for the word document, but this is how people still think. So when you think of the top, there's a DE strategy that most organizations talk about. And for DOD, there's a very well-known and published DOD digital engineering strategy that was published about two years ago. Now, the question is, how do you respond to that strategy? What do, you, what do organizations need to do? And honestly, we've seen inst, um, responses that have been all over the map, but leading organizations, one that have a pretty good knowledge of digital engineering and model-based engineering typically put together a digital engineering implementation plan. That's sometimes done at a center level or a very large enterprise level. Um, that plan then has different components. So if you go to the far right, 
the first component is thinking about the command media. What are the specs, the standards, the policy, the con ops, the governance? It's important to understand that. Then they think about the existing modeling applications. So they've already, organizations already have a huge investment in, in models. So what models are in development, which ones they need to procure or reuse, and which ones they need to acquire. So there's a collection of models that organizations already have that may not be organized or integrated like they would like. So they have that as a line item. Then they have the capabilities to do modeling and digital engineering. And this is where the Encozy model-based capabilities matrix comes in. This helps organizations assess their current state and desired state for modeling and digital engineering. So you look at the gaps and then you create plans to um, create projects that will close gaps in order for the organization to do modeling. This is where model management, model portfolio management typically scores very low, meaning it's ad hoc. Okay, so those different line items also are aligned with the model portfolio management guide, the document we're talking about today. So the guide provides what needs to be done, not the how. So as you start to go through the how do you do it, that's a whole nother set of instructions and information that needs to be developed. So for instance, there might be a model requirements guide, a model integration guide, a model security guide, a VNV guide, a CEM guide, a lifecycle management guide, style guide, development plan, intellectual property guide, metrics guide. And these are just a sample of the things that could be developed. And in fact, Aerospace has developed different documents in this area that we plan to re uh, release next year. And hopefully that will be a talk for next year. Those would be the elements on how and how well to do the elements of the model portfolio management guide. So the idea of the guide is it's a top level document to help organizations manage their portfolio of existing and models they're developing. Next slide, please. Let me talk about the contracting approach. So we believe the model portfolio management guide is already useful to an organization that has models, but it's also useful uh, when you start to look at the contracting process. So here on the left-hand side, as organizations start to put together the model-based acquisition strategy or DE acquisition strategy, you wanna select the model portfolio management and model management needs as engineering features, things that are very important to the organization to manage. Then they would think about how those features are instituted in the RFP. So for instance, if you have a SAO statement of work or performance work statement, you could have something like the contractor shall perform model portfolio management and model management. And then you'd refer to the model portfolio management guide. And then you want to have the contractors respond through the proposal prep instructions with their proposal volumes. How will they do it? What are they proposing that it would be done? They'd like, we'd like to see what the contractor response is in the SAO, if there's any tuning to the wording of the, of the statement of work. So you, the contractors generally have a response uh, that they can have there. And then with that, they would have their seed roll list. And part of the talk today, we'll talk about the, um, the options in tailoring for the guide and which typical seed rules you might want to have delivered. You might want to have a model portfolio management plan as an example, and there are a, a bunch of other ones. We'll go into that in more detail. Uh, this is really important to then have the contractors put together a solid cost volume. And this is where I've seen where things really fall apart and have fallen apart in the past, where um, the model portfolio management is spread across uh, DE functions or MBSE functions, and it's not really uh, priced well. It does We don't talk about what it takes in order to get this done as far as the basis of estimate. Because this is where you start talking about how will you manage repositories? What type of um, gateways do you need? How does it relate to configuration management, data management, risk management, security management, et cetera? So the cost volume is usually where things fall apart and don't hang together. So if you're responding to an RFP that has this, really make sure your cost volume is solid. And what that does is it results in a in a uh, series of charts, I'm sorry, a series of uh, responses on contract in which we have a very solid approach for model portfolio management and model management. And that uh, we have a clearly understood set of libraries, repositories, models, uh, objectives, et cetera. So this goes all the way back to define your digital engineering objectives. So if you would like, if the organization wants an integrated set of models, a well-known collection of models, 
models that have known interfaces, have known tools, have known owners, and you want to manage that collection in a, in a logical fashion, then this is a way you can contract in order to get it. So um, the other part I wanted to mention on this slide is that we don't want to confuse model portfolio management and manager with the ideas of model management, which is a, a typical tool function. So tools sim sometimes have ideas uh, or components say, ah, we're going to do model management, which really talks about CM. No, what we're talking about here is the higher level idea of managing a collection of models. They could be descriptive models in different tools. They could be analytical models. It's the whole collection. So I wanted to make that point and foot stomp that so it's clearly understood what we're talking about. Okay, so next chart, and I believe Misak, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Al. Um, here are some uh, use cases and uh, benefits for uh, a model portfolio management guide. First and foremost, uh, to allow is to allow a portfolio of models to be adequately managed for a corporation, business unit, enterprise, system of systems, system or project where many models are used. Second is to define and communicate both terms and principles related to managing a portfolio of models. Third is to ensure the portfolio of models meets the business needs of the organization and to identify model gaps and risks to the business objectives, thus providing portfolio information to characterize the needed modeling investment of dollars, time, and people to ensure that the portfolio of models continues to meet organizational business needs. Number four is to establish model portfolio governance across all the roles of the organizational model portfolio managers, individual model principal investigators, governance boards, and outside organizational stakeholders. Number five is to characterize models for acquisition, for development, for verification, for reuse, and integration with the goal of providing a more capable portfolio of models. Number six is to maintain the model repository to ensure that the latest models and components of those models are available to users when they are needed. Number seven is to ensure that appropriate controls are in place to allow only authorized users to get access to models and model elements. Number eight is to enhance model integration and model assurance, as well as applying risk management with the goal of enhancing trust in model utility. Number nine is to establish or adopt common standards and conventions, such as extensions, plugins, and scripts across the portfolio to enhance model interoperability, model development, model quality, and configuration control, of course. The use of common standards and conventions across the portfolio can enhance model reuse, reduce needed training, and allow organization to converge on common modeling tools. This can drive down the cost of modeling efforts in, in general. Number 10 is to ensure that the information technology, IT, underpinning the models evolves in a way that allows the portfolio of models to continue to be supported. Number 11 is to establish a reference document for contracting, as mentioned earlier, to ensure that all parties understand the scope of the model management efforts. This can be done by including this document in contracts um, as, and as a reference in the bidder's library. The guide can also be used as a reference to deliver a model portfolio management plan. Now that we know some of the use cases and benefits of the guide, here are a few definitions to be to consider. First, what is a portfolio? The Project Management Institute's standard for portfolio management simply defines a portfolio as projects, programs, sub-portfolios, and operations managed as a group to achieve strategic 
objectives. A more comprehensive definition of portfolio was given by Matur as a collection of projects or programs or other work grouped together to facilitate effective management of work to meet strategic business objectives. The projects or programs of the portfolio may not necessarily be interdependent or directly related. And the second part of this uh, quote and definition is, is uh, of uh, importance to consider. We define a model portfolio or a portfolio of models simply as a collection of models, where whether descriptive or analytical, related or otherwise, that have been grouped together and where the evaluation of that collection has been identified as being critical to evaluating the organization's investment strategies. Therefore, the role of the person responsible for managing the portfolio of models and model portfolio management in general is simply the administration or control of a collection of models, the purpose of which is to achieve strategic objectives with particular attention to utilizing organizational resources in an efficient manner. The life cycle of portfolio, uh, model portfolio management is also defined as a continuous set of activities that is recommended to be performed by model portfolio managers for the model portfolio management process to be successful. Uh, in contrast, uh, the definition of program and project management as defined by PMI are listed here as a reference because it is important to know that a, a portfolio of models is an ongoing thing. It doesn't stop like a project or some programs. So what are some of the roles and responsibilities associated with the model portfolio management? Of course, central to the model portfolio management is the role of the model portfolio manager, the program manager, and individual project managers, which are highlighted in red in this diagram. But there are other portfolio level and enterprise level roles that are crucial for the success of management of the portfolio. Such roles as requirements management, IT, HR, may be done at the portfolio level. Other roles such as configuration management, uh, data management, quality management, and um, um, security management um, may be administered at the enterprise level. Of course, every organization is organized differently and may choose to have these roles at different levels. Now let's take a closer look at how the role of configuration management and model portfolio management are related. Figure five in the guide illustrates the responsibilities of both model portfolio manager and configuration management. In the context of managing a portfolio configuration items, the identification, verification, and auditing fall under the responsibility of the, of the MPM. As CM controls all portfolio CIs concurrently. The configuration manager would be responsible in accepting or rejecting the model portfolio CIs, importing and managing them into the configuration management database, along with all other program level CIs. This example is representative of other roles and shared responsibilities of managing a portfolio of models. The role, interests, and expectations of all stakeholders, um, internal or external, also needs to be managed. The stakeholders can be internal or external to the model users, uh, can be external model users, associated organizational level leaders, and managers. The key steps or, for stakeholder management are the proper identification and engagement of all stakeholders. Table one in the, of the guide shows a few of the high level stakeholder roles, interests, and expectations that would uh, guide the potential communication needed. The list of the key stakeholders and stakeholder categories should be captured in a stakeholder engagement uh, section of the MPM plan as depicted here, which may be part of the NPM plan in general, or could be a separate standalone document. So to talk a little bit more about 
how the stakeholders fit into the big picture and the overall NPM life cycle and the details of each phase of that life cycle is Jordan Howie. That's me, Scott. Um, so yeah, I'll be going over the life cycle and how everything fits. Um, so the key roles surrounding the NPM life cycle uh, really start with the model portfolio governance, which acts as the governing body. Um, so they conduct activities such as uh, business strategy, operational strategy, um, and roadmap development for the organization. And uh, model portfolio governance uh, coordinates with the, and guides the uh, model portfolio manager who actually performs the model portfolio management. Uh, so this role includes activities such as model acquisition, integration, configuration management, quality, and products as they flow through the NPM life cycle. And the NPM life cycle differs from a project or a model life cycle in that um, projects and their models have an individual life cycle where they, the uh, individual model may eventually be retired or archived. Um, but however, portfolios may never fully retire as long as an organization exists. Uh, so with these thoughts, the NPM uh, document adopts the life cycle of the Project Management Institute's standard for portfolio management. Uh, so the NPM life cycle starts at initiation, uh, and goes to planning, and then the execution of portfolio management tasks. And the NPM monitoring control phase uh, raises new objectives and concerns to address by sort of cycling back to NPM initiation and repeating the process all over again. Next slide, please. So the first phase of NPM is uh, NPM initiation. So this can be looked at as kind of like the lower level of governance over the management of the portfolio. Uh, so establishing a framework for NPM to be planned and executed. Uh, you can see here activities include uh, such as developing NPM strategy, con ops, criteria, stakeholders and roles, a roadmap where you can define components, uh, requirements, guidelines, metrics, plugins and libraries and things of that nature. Next slide, please. So here's a breakdown of uh, the different components of a model portfolio that you might get uh, that are determined in the initiation phase. At the highest level, you have the governing components that are uh, include security, intellectual property, uh, standards, then the enterprise level breaks down into your program and higher level enterprise model and libraries. And then you keep going further and you break that down to a program level um, and uh, more specific models such as uh, models and projects that uh, when you have the lower level, you, you end up getting your lower level assets uh, under your projects. So such as plugins, extensions, scripts, and things like that. Next slide, please. All right, and here's another breakdown of your different model types you might find in a model portfolio. Uh, they'll tend to be more symbolic since we're dealing with digital artifacts and models. Um, and the initi uh, NPM initiation phase will identify what analytic or mathematical models the portfolio might adopt, as well as the descriptive ones. Um, or if there's opportunity to include hybrid models, that'll be de all be determined uh, during this first phase of initiation. Next slide, please. All right, the next slide we have, uh, or next phase, we have NPM planning. Uh, this is really centered around defining that NPM scope. So understanding the components of the portfolio, uh, drawing relationships and interdependencies to capitalize on that may be, uh, they may achieve certain organizational strategic objectives. Um, you're creating your registries, list permissions, and supporting software necessary to ma uh, manage the portfolio. So with planning, you're, you're really setting up your portfolio's infrastructure and preparing it for execution of NPM tasks. Next slide, please. Uh, so this phase is NPM execution. Uh, this is the active management of the portfolio. So it's leading component delivery, uh, managing risks, facilitating communication, monitoring benefits, and managing assets and resources of the portfolio. And some of the activities for, for this phase include establishing and man managing the model repository, uh, model views, acquisition, integration, configure manage configuration management, excuse me, and access. 
So execution is really facilitating the synergy of your pro, uh, portfolio components and seeking more opportunity to capitalize on models as uh, risks and issues are resolved. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, we have NPM monitoring and control. Uh, so this is used as uh, used to assess the performance of the portfolio. I recommend changes as organizational shifts, uh, organizational needs shift, uh, and ensure compliance with standards. So some of these activities that come out of this, this phase are assessing the portfolio using NPM metrics, uh, monitoring portfolio risks, optimizing the portfolio, uh, and maintaining the models in terms of updates, data management, and consistency, um, reuse, retirement, and archive, and and things like that. Um, so this phase is, is used to sort of translate or transition models either to an ending state if, if we want to retire and archive them or, or to a recovery state if we want to maybe reuse them um, and recycle them into to a, a shifting portfolio as organizational needs might change by the end of the life cycle. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, here's a, an example. Uh, this is a diagram from the NPM document that kind of describes the process for model reuse. Uh, so models in the portfolio may, may prove to continue to be useful for the portfolio by the end of the life cycle. Uh, but some adjustments may need to be applied based on changes in the organizational need or mission. Uh, so this is just outlining those high level steps that would need to be taken during monitoring control to be able to identify and repair those models that can be recycled. So uh, planning for the reuse, establishing your reuse registry for all the, all the models that are potential, uh, present potential to be reused, um, analyzing uh, for reuse and, and improving the reuse. And then it cycles back as the life cycle continues. And I'll hand it back over to Misak. Thank you, Jordan, for that in-depth uh, review of the model portfolio management life cycle. Um, so here are a few of the major deliverables from uh, contractors, which may be the model uh, accession list, including data and view accession lists. An updated risk register, an overall NPM plan and governance plan are some of the deliverables that could be uh, provided to um, the government or to the um, contracting organization. Other, other deliverables from activities outlined in the guide are also possible. The model accession list, MOL, uh, is an index of working models that is made readily available for review uh, by model integrators. The model data accession list is an accessible list of working data, items that may not yet be deliverable uh, to relevant stakeholders. Uh, this will allow for ongoing evaluation to make sure that the contractors are on track. Uh, the model view accession list is a digital view of accessible um, uh, to uh, relevant stakeholders who request to view model views uh, with the understanding that they may not be deliverable. A portfolio risk register, which is a collection of risks to be managed with respect to impact on the portfolio, should be planned and established here as well. The NPM plan is central to uh, the guide and it defines the key components in the NPM lifecycle and authorizes the allocation of resources. The plan provides the structure of the portfolio, which includes the hierarchy and organization of the models, programs and projects within the portfolio. The plan also identifies the key enabling processes for the portfolio execution. The contents of the NPM plan can be contained within a single document for small portfolios, or maybe several documents if need be. Governance plan, which may be a standalone view, document, or model. And of course, the NPM plan can also be modeled as well um, as an enterprise level model, or maybe a uh, uh, you know, the governance plan may be also part of the NPM plan, depending on the size and scope of the NPM uh, strategy of the organization. So how can organizations adopt and uh, contracting entities um, contract and tailor the NPM plan? 
So how would an organization adopt a guide? If an organization chooses to adopt the NPM guide as is, it can use it to perform gap assessments along with the model-based uh, capabilities matrix described earlier to develop into implementation plans to fill in the gaps in order to achieve its business objectives. Um, contract tailoring may be needed when the NPM guide is a reference document on a contract. In this case, the organization can identify changes by tailoring out sections that are not needed or not applicable to their portfolio or program. The associated uh, agreed to deliverables can be identified in the contract data requirements lists and the data item description associated with the contract. So in summary, uh, the NPM guide fills in the hole in what is meant by model management for a collection of models that enables the DOD digital engineering uh, strategy in support of engineering activities throughout the development life cycle. It is written to be tailorable. It is a guide by design. It's tailorable by organizations of all shapes and sizes to best fit their needs and the needs of their customers. It can and has been used as a reference document on contracts, as mentioned earlier, uh, by providing a common set of terms, tasks, and guidance to create a comprehensive MPA approach in RFPs by identifying the necessary goals and best practices for model management. This guide is, of course, cleared for public release and is freely available from the Aerospace Corporation as a technical operating report, TOR 2020-01577. Um, Furthermore, this guide is in the process of being adopted um, uh, for wider release uh, through INCOSI, as mentioned earlier. And I understand that there's some um, um, chat uh, questions about accessing the guide, and we're gonna make sure that we make that available to you. With that, I would like to open up the floor to any questions or comments. Hi. Um, so there is a question from Derek Body. How does this fit in with the maturity matrix? If you're aware of that. I'll let Al answer that question. Al? Sure, thanks, Misak. So there is a row in the INCOSI model-based capabilities matrix, which talks about model management. So that row is uh, clearly the assessment criteria for the model management approach for the collection of models. So when you look at the different steps or maturity steps within the model-based capabilities matrix, it has the columns such as, is, the, uh, is there an assigned role for model portfolio management? Has it uh, does it depend on a known standard guide or policy? Is it, has it been adopted by an organization and has it been adopted by the enterprise? So this is exactly answering the mail uh, for how do you do model portfolio management and how do you then mature that from a low level assessment to a higher functioning organizational capability to manage a collection of models. And interestingly enough, for those of you in the Air Force, the model-based capabilities matrix was adopted Air Force-wide as a set of Air Force mature, DE maturity measures, and they preserved the same row for model management in that maturity assessment as well. That concludes the answer to the question. Thank you. And I think you also answered the next question, has the guide been adopted by uh, the U.S. Air Force, and I believe that last answer also answered that. Um, on the next question, have data item descriptions or DIDs been developed for use? Um, I'll answer that. Um, uh, right now, we have not developed specific DIDs, but that's it's a very good suggestion that should be one of the next steps going forward. Would you like to add anything to that, Al? Uh, well, so in the back of the guide, I believe we provide outlines. So they're not exactly DIDs, but they are outlines. So um, that's where we are as far as providing that type of information. Q 
you. Um, next question, is a reference model available with the model portfolio management guide um, embedded in the model? Uh, that, that's a good question. Right, uh, right now, uh, the, with the guide, there isn't a reference model per se in a digital format that you, one would say, this is the enterprise level uh, uh, model of the portfolio. But, but the guide wasn't intended to provide a reference model and uh, it may not necessarily be, since it's a, a, a document that describes the management and uh, the, um, the tasks and um, activities associated with model management, it, not, it's, um, it may be a good idea to add that and that, that's a good suggestion, uh, but it wasn't intended to have a reference model because it's not something that is contractually uh, um, you know, yeah. obligated uh, to be performed. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, and this is directed a bit more closely towards you, Al, um, is the Incozy model capability matrix available for everyone? And if not, can it be made available? The answer is yes and yes. So the Incozy model-based capabilities matrix and user's guide is a published set of documents from Incozy. So if you're an Incozy member or CAB member, your organization's a member, it's a free download from their site. Let me also note though, Aerospace has their own, has another site that we put together. So if you go to aerospace.org slash MBCA, and I'll post this in the chat, then that site not only is a site where you can download the documents, but it's also a site in which you can do a free online assessment for your organization in which the software walks you through a survey of the tool and then it, it returns both a PDF overview plus um, editable Excels uh, spreadsheets on your markings. And if you go that route, please put in notes uh, because the notes help you uh, capture the thought and the purpose behind your single seat assessment. So that site should be a, a good reference site for you, over. There doesn't seem to be any more questions. Oh, never mind. Um, have you looked at uh, DEIX working groups digital viewpoint model as a potential starting point for the reference model. And I can't remember off the top of my head what that acronym stands for, but it's one of the <clears throat> working groups within, I believe, yeah, so Yeah, I'm familiar with the, the Dixie Wig and the DVM. Um, so uh, we didn't specifically try to draw those two efforts together uh, with the MPM guide. Um, however, uh, I'm open to suggestions. So if the question came from a Dixie Wig working group member, uh, please contact me. We can think about how to strategize going forward and do that. To add to that, I'll mention earlier that we're in the process of uh, getting the guide adopted through uh, INCOSI, which is being worked through the um, one of the working groups and a collaboration. We're currently open for uh, independent peer reviewers right now going through the process. And anybody from INCOSI is more than welcome to volunteer and we will be glad to have you on board and talk about other synergies with other guides and standards. Um, another question. Do you typically recommend doing a separate MPM for classified models versus unclassified models? I'll try to address that. Um, yes and no, it all depends on the needs of the organization. There's uh, sections within the MPM guide that we do touch upon the need for specific security and of course classified level models. Uh, it, it is entirely up to how the organization is already structured. It may be uh, warranted to have two separate strategies, but there's going to be a lot of synergies, a lot of duplication. And it may be, you know, because it is a management guide, it, it may, then the management may be structured in a way where 
the same individuals involved in I mean, managing overall uh, the data and models associated with uh, the, 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 the development the efforts, efforts at the enterprise level, maybe all in a core group. Uh, or for very large organizations, they may divide based on the visions of labor, you know, one group of uh, management activities like HR and uh, configuration management at the classified level and another level at a different level. And it's entirely up to the organization on how they choose to implement the guide and it's entirely ta tailorable uh, to suit the needs of, you know, the security concerns for the organization. Yeah, I would, uh, this is Al, so I would pile on and agree totally with, with that approach, Misak. Uh, the thought is, is that it depends on the, the digital engineering objectives of the organization. So it depends on how the organization wants to reuse or extend models. Uh, many times you can write up, uh, so if you take unclassified models and you write up to a classified system and then extend them, then you probably do want to have a guide that covers both. If your objective is not to do that, then you can go. You could have separate stovepipes. But certainly, the whole idea is to eliminate stovepipes and to leverage the investment that organizations are making because models are so expensive to develop, manage, maintain, uh, with the infrastructure and the intellectual capital that goes into them. That it, that it really makes sense to try to be comprehensive. Okay, uh, Alex, there are any more questions? It does not seem like there are any questions at the moment. So um, if you have any closing comments, um, I guess now would be a good time. Yep, I'm ready for closing remarks. All right, so one of the things I wanted to mention is that our talks are recorded and the materials are online for download. So one of the important aspects of model portfolio management is the valuation of models. How do you value your models in your collection? We had a talk last month on model assurance levels or MALs. So the model assurance level talk is squarely slated at how do you value models and how do you assume that they have the right quality? So if you haven't had a chance to review that material or review that talk, then that would be a really good one to do in association with this one. So as I mentioned, the slides from today plus the guide are available from our site. The recording will be posted in our Aerospace Corporation YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna follow up this uh, event with a feedback survey. So a quick five question survey to you on email for our yes, no radial button types of things. If you have an idea for a talk that would make sense for the system engineering forum going forward, we'd love to get that input. And of course the registration is open for future events as well. The kicker here is that we're working on our 2022 slate of offerings. So in the next couple of months, we'll be posting those on our site. And with that, let me uh, flip to our last slide. Thank you so much for your attention and your questions that really made this for a rich experience and I really appreciate it. So with that we're going to conclude the recording and uh, thank you very much.